Welcome to Geek Philosophy, where we love geeky wisdom. If you're new to the channel, my name is Brian, and today we're going to talk about Baldur's Gate 3 and how this monumental success of a game might shape the future of Dungeons & Dragons. Before we dive in, I want to highlight the Dungeon Craft channel and Professor Dungeon Master's video on this very topic. He had some valuable insights about this, so you should check it out. I'll leave a link in the description below. I have to say, Professor Dungeon Master is usually ahead of the game, pun intended, on a lot of the developments in the tabletop role-playing game industry, but if he turns out to be wrong about something, he usually lets you know. Although I generally agree with everything that he said in that video, I had a few other thoughts that I wanted to add to the conversation. I think it's important to acknowledge that Baldur's Gate 3, even though it was not produced by Wizards of the Coast, has potentially become one of the most influential representations of D&D in digital form. I mean, Baldur's Gate 3 wasn't just a release, it was sort of a phenomenon. The game sold a bunch of copies right out of the gate, and like Professor Dungeon Master pointed out, almost as many as there are players' handbooks out there. But all of this success is really credited to Larian Studios, who produced Baldur's Gate 3. The team spent about five or six years almost developing this video game based on a role-playing game that they love. You can feel how much they love it. The sheer amount of options and character customization and the incorporation of 5e rule set into gameplay arguably makes it the most faithful adaptation of the D&D game into a video game for. But this comes at a very interesting time because in a way this puts Wizards of the Coast at a crossroads. There's a growing perception that while independent studios like Larian are deeply passionate about the essence of D&D, some of the decision makers at Wizards of the Coast may have lost a little bit of touch of what makes D&D great. And maybe with them focusing too much on the current model of revenue generation that exists in the video game industry, maybe pulling them away from what makes D&D great? Let me be clear about this. I'm not talking about people like Jeremy Crawford or Chris Perkins or any of the other really enthusiastic game designers who work at Wizards. But some of the recent choices made by the executive team, those who have been in charge of where they're steering the ship, have left a lot of people in the community wondering, is D&D really evolving? Or is the leadership team straying away from what made D&D so iconic to begin with? I also want to point out that I am not on one side or the other when it comes to video games versus tabletop role-playing games. I think that they each have their own unique benefits and experiences, and I truly appreciate them for what they bring to the table. But I want to draw attention to something that most of us haven't really thought about in recent years. Video games versus tabletop games. This used to be a bigger division, but the Venn diagram of people who play tabletop games and video games has more of an overlap these days than ever before. I can't think of anyone that I personally know who plays tabletop role-playing games that doesn't also play some sort of video game. But here's the thing. With Baldur's Gate 3 now available to people, I don't think it's an insurmountable task to get a tabletop-only D&D player to start playing Baldur's Gate. I mean, it's already pretty similar. It's turn-based. The rules are already kind of the same anyway, and they even get to see the dice being rolled on screen. But how about the video game only gamers that are out there? The ones that haven't ever rolled some dice at the table. How do we get them to also play D&D while they're enjoying games like Baldur's Gate 3? Well, let's dive a little bit deeper into the whole concept of role-playing themed video games like Baldur's Gate 3 and tabletop role-playing games. Baldur's Gate 3 showcases some amazing graphics and intricate artwork and the cutscenes and all the action stuff is really, really well done. And the spell effects, even the spell effects are cool. It's awesome to see a fireball light up the screen, right? But if you're playing at my tabletop and my D&D session, we don't have any amazing 4K digital effects. But here's the thing, that's not a bug, that's a feature. When I describe a fireball, the visualization that takes place is unique to me and my table. What I describe is imagined differently by everybody at the table. Even if it's just a slight variation in their mind, the action is played out differently in everyone's minds. And even more than that, the way the players describe their fireball may be different from the way I describe it for my NPCs. And it'll differ again from player to player. However they've imagined their character's spell effects, that's what they'll describe. And that's just one example of a single spell. 
video games have to present hundreds of pre-programmed outcomes in a battle, and they may all be amazing, don't get me wrong, but even the most sophisticated role-playing themed video game, like Baldur's Gate 3, has its limitations. It can never possess all of the boundless possibility and the personal creativity that comes with pencil, paper, dice, and imagination. That's not a slight against it, it's just a different thing. And for my table, and for your table, our imaginations aren't limited by a budget. It provides an experience that even the most advanced video games can never replicate. Again, I'm all for video games and for tabletop gaming. I think Baldur's Gate 3 is great. Crystal's already started playing and I'm ready to dive into it as soon as my Mac will be able to play it. But we know what it can and can't do. It's not just video games. Even the most sophisticated virtual tabletop that's used to represent what's going on at your table still has limitations. So when you start adding animation and spell effects and all kinds of other cool stuff, it may be awesome, but you're also limiting a little bit what can happen in the imagination of others. And I think there is a place for virtual tabletops. I definitely do, especially when you're playing with people that can't get together at the same location in person. But I'm a tabletop role-playing game guy. I know that when I use a miniature at my table, that it's representing my character. And I know that there's a difference between the VTT token representing my character and the character itself. They represent my character so that I can better visualize the map and the spatial relationship for combat and all of those things. But let's talk about that Venn diagram a second. Those video game only gamers who have never played a tabletop role playing game. Will they understand that it's just a representation of the character that really lives in our collective imagination? Or will they think that's my character because they see it and it seems like it's the same thing, but it's not the same thing. And to me, that's not D&D. So attempting to model a virtual tabletop as an alternative to a game like Baldur's Gate 3 seems like a misguided approach. I think Wizards of the Coast should tread carefully here. If they push their new tabletop as the new definitive D&D experience, they risk distancing two core segments of their existing audience. And this is a bit of an oversimplification, but let's have two major groups that might make decisions about whether or not to use this virtual tabletop, okay? We've got our tactical gaming enthusiasts that really want to push in, optimize how they can do combat, and defeat enemies in battle. On the other end of the spectrum, maybe you have social role players who are really into D&D for the role playing experience of developing their character and the social interactions that occur during the game. Well, those tactical combat enthusiasts might say, well, if this is where D&D is going, I could just play Baldur's Gate 3. And the people who love role playing will feel overlooked since their passion isn't primarily focused on maps and minis or virtual tabletops. So even though I'm skeptical that they'll go this way, I think Wizards of the Coast could potentially capitalize on the success of Baldur's Gate 3 in a different way. Some Baldur's Gate 3 players are experiencing the D&D universe for the first time through that video game. Why not show them how they could delve deeper into this game, into this world? Invite them to experience the ultimate playstyle of boundless imagination without the constraints of a screen. Sure, not everybody's going to want that, but if they don't want that anyway, they're going to keep playing their video game. And I know this would mean having a strategic pivot and emphasize the timeless charm of books and pencil and paper and dice. And it's a lofty aspiration, but one that could usher in a new wave of D&D enthusiasts. But I think it's a better option than having an amazing virtual tabletop that never gets used. Because as great as it is, it's only a lackluster version of an existing video game that does it better. All right, that was just a bit of my own geek philosophy about this, and it may change. Who knows? I might learn new things and see new things and completely change my mind. If you found this video useful, please like and subscribe and ring the notification bell and share your thoughts in the comments below. Let's encourage some positive discussion and respect for all viewpoints, please. And because we're in this seemingly at a crossroads moment, so to speak, for Wizards of the Coast and D&D, I'd like to leave you with some geek philosophy from Robert Frost. Two roads diverged in a wood and I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Cheers.